VRAM has been the talk of the PC gaming community this year, thanks to a rash of console ports expecting, nay demanding, at least 8GB even at 1080p. 4GB and 6GB cards are reaching fire sale prices, 16GB cards are more in demand than ever among gamers, so why is everyone ignoring this one? The Radeon 7 broke with tradition in AMD's naming str Actu actually that's that's not true. AMD's never stuck with a naming structure for more than two generations until the current one, so a complete departure in model number from the previous cards is actually kinda on brand for AMD at the time. The preceding Vega 56 and 64 were named according to the number of compute units. As the Radeon 7 had fewer CUs than the previous flagship, naming it the Vega 60 was out of the question. Instead, it was named the 7 after its production node, as it was the first consumer GPU manufactured on the 7 nanometer process. Released in February 2019 and discontinued a mere five months later in July, the Radeon 7 has been considered an expensive flop a workstation GPU shoehorned into a consumer package to pay lip service to competing with Nvidia's flagships, while actually serving only to fill time until the launch of Navi later in the year. With 16 gigs of HBM2, it had a massive amount of both memory and bandwidth. Overkill for the time, but potentially perfect for games of the 2020s. And yet, at the time, the 7 was considered to be lacking something. Rasterized performance was judged to be on par with Nvidia's flagship 1080 Ti from two years earlier, and the 7 offered no answer to Nvidia's ray tracing party trick. Although it launched at, hypothetically, $700, in many areas it was considered to be a paper launch and was a notable victim of price hikes during the scalper pandemic. As such, it didn't make its way into the hands of very many gamers. As a Vega unit with HBM VRAM, it did attract the attention of the Ethereum crowd, and it's for that reason why a glut of stock has appeared on AliExpress in recent months. It's also quite common to see faulty cards being sold for spares on eBay, and this shouldn't be surprising. While responsible miners will have undervolted and underclocked their cards, unfortunately not all miners are responsible. Thankfully, my card is in full working order, so to see if it's worthy of your attention in a crowded second-hand market, I ran it through a gauntlet of modern and popular games on my moderately priced gaming PC, featuring a Ryzen 5 5600X and 32 gigs of DDR4 3600. To start off this test, I bought myself a copy of Alan Wake 2, which was going to be the subject of its own video, but that didn't quite pan out. I did, however, play enough on a GTX 1080 Ti to know that this is not how the characters are supposed to look. I mean, you never really know with Remedy, but I can confirm that Vega era GPUs cannot currently run the game without massive glitches. Instead, then, I stepped back one entry in Remedy's catalogue to Control, a game that originally released in the same year as the Radeon 7. Although Control is considered to prefer Nvidia due to its integration of RT effects, the 7 can give a reasonable experience. At 1080p high, it comes in a little under 90 FPS on average and could happily run at a locked 60 FPS. At 1440, you'd have to drop settings to even reach a 60 average, which is a bit disappointing, but perhaps not all that surprising. Fast forward to 2023, The Last of Us is the title that kicked off the VRAM panic at the start of the year and is one game you might reasonably want to play with a Radeon 7. Does it work? Well, yeah, pretty well actually. At 1080 high it can just beat a 60fps average, with lows a little under 50. This is a technical victory over the GTX 1080 Ti, in percentile lows at least, but is also a few frames faster than the RX 6600. In case you are hoping the extra large frame buffer would allow you to jump up to max settings, it's possible but not ideal. Frames on average drop into the low 50s and can even fall into the low 40s. Not unplayable by any stretch of the imagination, but also a little short of a perfect experience. Another game that prompted people to question the relevance of lower VRAM cards was Resident Evil 4 Remake. 
performance is generally pretty great in this game, though allowing settings to enter the red zone usually ends up in a crash. The Radeon 7 is one of the rare occasions where I've been able to just choose the max preset without worrying about the consequences. Without adjusting texture settings at all, the game glides along at an average 95 FPS. Of course, in this case, max is not max settings, because the 7 doesn't support RT, but that aside, this is almost as good an experience as you can ask for in this game, and is about 5 frames faster than the 1080 Ti, 6600 or 5700 XT managed with reduced texture settings. Unfortunately, it seems like this generation of Radeons isn't quite matching the equivalent G-forces in Jedi Survivor. That's not to say that this is a bad time. The Radeon 7 can drive about 60 FPS on average at 1080 high. It's just that the 1080 Ti scores about 9 frames higher. 1% lows are much closer, being only a frame apart, so maybe there's something to be said for having more than 11 gigs of VRAM in this title after all. At 1080 high, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart runs surprisingly well on the Radeon 7. Although the start of the run is in the 50s, it's impressively free from hitches and stutters as I pan the camera around, and the average FPS from the total benchmark run surpasses 70. I don't currently have a very complete range of comparisons for Ratchet & Clank, but the Titan XP is within a frame or two of the AMD card here. Starfield's next update promises to improve performance on GeForce cards, but in the meantime the Radeon 7 performs way better than any similar spec GeForce does. In the cutscene in the lodge, the average is almost 65 FPS at 1080 medium and falls to 55 at 1080 high. Outside in New Atlantis, that number falls into the 40s at high, but instance encounters like this space station fight can go well into the 70s and 80s. As always, Forza Horizon 5 is a great experience. There's room here not only for 1080p Ultra, but also 1440p Ultra, and possibly even 4K, though more likely at a lower preset. More on that later. The 1080 Ultra benchmark run scores exactly 80 FPS with lows over 60, so would be great for a locked 60 FPS. At 1440, the average is now down to 67 FPS with lows of 55. Still pretty playable in my opinion, especially as most of the time the game isn't quite so demanding as this, but you can always drop to high or add some FSR to keep above 60. Forza Motorsport actually didn't do too badly, considering its reputation. However, the benchmark results don't give the whole picture. At 1080 medium with resolution scaling disabled, it scored 84 FPS with lows above 60, and pushing up to high making sure to restart the game, as settings don't always take otherwise, saw that drop only as far as 70 FPS, with lows in the 50s. Moving into an actual race, performance didn't deviate too much from that, but the cinematic shots at the beginning of the race were still pretty stuttery. Halo Infinite has a known preference for new architectures like RDNA and Turing, so while it's not impossible to get a decent gaming experience on cards like the Radeon 7, it can be easily outperformed by lower-end newer cards. For example, at 1080 high, the 7 can get a very acceptable 74 FPS average in Overland gameplay, with lows just a hair above 60 FPS, whereas the RX 6600 a card with a 50% lower MSRP and 55% lower TDP scores about 15-20% to higher at the same settings. A Plague Tale Requiem has no such proclivities, and so the Radeon 7 is more than competitive here. At 1080 high it can manage 69 frames per second on average, and just above the magic 50 at the low end. This is a little better than the 5700 XT, and a lot better than the 6600. It's a few frames below the 1080 Ti, but this is still a decent enough result. This generation of Radeons doesn't perform so well in Cyberpunk, and the 7 is pretty disappointing when compared to later cards. At 1080 medium we still can't see a 60fps average, and strangely it's slightly behind the overclocked 64. The 6600, 5700 XT and GTX 1080 Ti all far surpass this, even at high settings. 
a preset which the 7 could only run at 45 FPS. In Spider-Man Remastered, the difference between cards is more as you'd expect. At both 1080 and 1440 very high, the Radeon 7 can achieve very playable results, the former reaching 110 FPS with lows of 55. 1440 averages 84 and drops to 50, on par with both the 1080 Ti and 5700 XT, and between 15 and 20% faster than even the overclocked Vega 64. I can't compare Fortnite results from the Radeon 7 to any of my previous tests, as the new OG update runs significantly better than the last one did. With no other context presently available, I can say that the game runs at 260 FPS at 1080 low, with max view distance and no resolution scaling. Turning up to medium offers a nice increase to image quality, but the draw distance on things like shadows can be distractingly close. Still, it runs at an impressive 200 FPS with lows above 144. The maximum quality experience possible on the Radeon 7 is the Epic preset with software RT and nanite complex geometry, and naturally all this fanciness causes the frame rate to tank. Averages now drop to 50 FPS, but I imagine it's possible to achieve a better balance by tweaking some settings. Call of Duty... Oh god... They have a Marvel intro. What the actual f***? Anyway, Cringe of Duty Warzone performs very well on the Radeon 7. At the Ultra preset, which isn't really as ultra as the name suggests, the game runs at in excess of 100 FPS on average and about 71% lows. Turning up to 1440 would probably benefit from a drop to balanced, which for some reason is the name of the next setting down from Ultra, as Ultra sees averages in the 70s, but lows drop into the 50s. What you gonna do with all that video RAM? If you bought your 16GB Radeon GPU for that big old VRAM pool, I'm guessing you'd like to know how well it can leverage it. Well, none of the resolutions and quality settings so far even touch the sides, so if I was going to really test this capacity, I was going to have to drag some sliders to the right. At 4K Ultra, The Last of Us might only be good for about 18 FPS, but it's still only using about 11 gigs of VRAM. RE4 is a little closer to acceptable in terms of FPS, to the point where I think some upscaling could actually get a playable frame rate, but it still says it needs just 13 gigabytes, and in my test run it's mostly using about 11 to 12. Jedi Survivor is intolerably slow at 4K Epic, but it's allocating over 12.5 gigs and using about 12 of them. Without messing with graphics mods or high res texture packs, and without the option of RT, I don't think it's possible to fully utilise the Radeon 7's VRAM while gaming in 2023. Or if it is, it certainly won't be at a frame rate that a near 5 year old graphics card can provide. But how about overclocking? After all, the highlight of the previous Vega cards had been their headroom for tweaking. The Vega 56 and 64 could have their power consumption dramatically cut down by undervolting, and yet could still be overclocked by a substantial margin. In that regard, I didn't have much luck with the Radeon 7. Undervolting worked a treat, allowing for power consumption figures as low as 175 watts in gameplay, but no amount of playing with sliders, even overvolted, would result in a higher clock speed. I'd see 1900MHz plus in Combustor, but as soon as I booted up a game it would drop back into the mid-1700s. Setting a minimum frequency, either in Afterburner or the Radeon drivers, would either have no effect or would lock into a fixed 700MHz clock speed. Even replacing the stock thermal pad with some MX4, while having a noticeable effect on both the package and hotspot temps, didn't change matters. Maybe I'm missing something, but the best I could expect was a 200MHz boost to the VRAM. So, 
In a time where high VRAM cards are getting more important, is the Radeon 7 being unfairly overlooked? I can't quite say yes. None of the games tested got even close to 16 gigs of utilization, and trying to get there involves choosing settings or resolutions that the card can't really handle anyway. That means you'd only buy a Radeon 7 if the price to performance was right, and that depends largely on what games you want to play. If you're looking for an economical card, this ain't it. Undervolting helps, but the RX 6600 and the XT versions are going to offer similar or better FPS, and with lower power consumption. You certainly don't want to buy this for future proofing, as there's no ray tracing and no DX12 Ultimate. And as I was finishing this script, it emerged that driver support might be terminated soon, meaning anyone picking up a Vega or Polaris card might want to start looking into Nimei's drivers. If I owned a Radeon 7, or could pick one up with a guarantee, then it would ideally need to be around the £150 mark or less. As it stands, it actually costs almost double that, and even at £200 or less, it still has some stiff competition. Unless you specifically need 16 gigs of VRAM for productivity, or some AI deep fakery business, then I can't recommend it. And you're not missing out by buying a better card with less VRAM for less money. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.